Thank you all for joining us today. This is session two of Investigating Time Series of Satellite Imagery. My name is Amber McCollum, and I will be your presenter. For this training, we have two two-hour sessions um, on April 15th and April 17th. Note that you only need to attend one session per day, and the, the same material is presented twice. We just have two sessions for our international audience. You can also find all the course materials listed on the website here. This includes past recordings, data links, and homework exercises. So we'll have time for questions at the end of the session. However, you can also email myself or my colleague Cindy Schmidt at our email addresses shown here. We will have one follow on homework and the homework should be available um, on the website now via Google Forms. So you'll need to um, complete the homework and attend both of these sessions to obtain a certificate of completion. Also, just to let you guys know that um, on the homework, there are questions from both lectures and both exercises. So it might be best to um, look at the homework while you're completing the exercises and then even maybe write your answers down on a separate sheet of paper or have them ready to go for when you submit them in the Google form. And there's a note about that um, shown at the top of the homework as well. Um, and as I mentioned, you need to finish that homework by the deadline, Wednesday, May 1st, so that's two weeks from today, um, and attend both live webinars to obtain the certificate of completion. And it does take a little bit of time to get all of these certificates processed and out to everyone. Um, so do please uh, allow for about two months before you will receive your certificate. Again, here are the course prerequisites. Um, you should take our e-learning course, Introduction to Remote Sensing, or have some equivalent knowledge. You should also take our previous webinar on change detection for land cover mapping. Also for this session in particular, um, we will use Google Chrome to conduct our exercise. And it's also a really good idea to have a Google Earth Engine account. We won't actually be doing any um, script within the Google Earth Engine um, code editor, uh, but you might want to if you're familiar with the language. So it's great to have that account. It's um, free for, for folks to register and the link to sign up is, is shown here. So as I mentioned, you can access all the course materials at our website shown here. And this includes a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation and that'll be available in both English and Spanish and a PDF of uh, each week's in-class exercise and the associated data that you need. Um, a link to view the recording of the webinar and then again the, the link for the, the homework submission. So in session one, we provided an introduction to time series analysis and we completed an exercise with the um, LPDAC appears online tool. So in this session, we will review other vegetation disturbance algorithms and focus on land trender with an exercise at the end. So this is our agenda for today's session. We will first briefly discuss forest disturbance algorithms, and then we'll talk in depth about the land trender algorithm. Then I'll provide an overview of some other types of vegetation disturbance algorithms that you may be interested in. And there's this really great review paper um, shown here, Cohen et al. from 2017, called How Similar Are Forest Disturbance Maps Derived from Different Landsat Time Series Algorithms? Um, and so a lot of the material I'll present at the end of this lecture um, comes from that paper. So that's a great place to go if you have questions about those specific algorithms. And then finally, we will conduct our land trender exercise. So first an overview of forest disturbance algorithms. 
In order to assess change through a series of images, various algorithms are used. They can be used for general mapping of disturbance patterns across a landscape and for the establishment of relationships between human activities and drivers of natural disturbances. With time series of data and information about ground-based activities, you could establish the differences between things like uh, urban development or tree mortality from insects. They can also be used to map things like recovery of a forest after a wildfire event. Most algorithms use one of two primary approaches. Either they focus on a deviation from normal patterns or they evaluate long-term trends. Those focusing on the deviations use multiple dates to first establish some type of stable condition. Then you can separate true change from background noise. Others analyze trends to separate longer term duration events from year to year noise like phenology and vegetation. In some instances, algorithms can use both of these approaches. So we will examine some of these later on. Therefore, depending on your question or study area, you may want to use one algorithm versus another. Additionally, some algorithms are refined further to meet the needs of a specific region of interest. Some algorithms use different bands or indices in their analysis, such as the use of the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, or the Normalized Burn Ratio, or NBR. They can also simply use specific bands of an image to analyze spectral properties. Some algorithms also work better primarily in forests or in all vegetation types that um, could include things like shrublands or grasslands. Additionally, some have higher accuracy for high magnitude events. So these are things like really intense wildfires um, that have high burn severity while others are uh, better at detecting subtle changes on the landscape, um, such as those um, that pertain to insect um, disease. So for this training, we're, we're going to focus on the Landsat-based detection of trends in disturbance and recovery, or Landtrender. And this algorithm really um, performs well in a variety of applications and um, because it has this really great user interface via Google Earth Engine, it's a great use case um, to show in this type of training. So first, I just want to give you an overview of what the land trender algorithm does and looks like. So the land trender algorithm was developed by Robert Kennedy's lab at Oregon State University. And it recognizes that change is not generally a contrast between two dates, but it's a continual process operating on multiple timescales. And therefore, this algorithm is really good for both short and long-term events. Landtrender generates one yearly composite image and forms a Landsat time series stack, or LTS. And it does this across a date range of interest. Landtrender focuses on three primary components, the use of yearly data, analysis of each pixel from a year within the stack, and the ability to temporally segment events, therefore preserving both of these uh, short and long-term changes. We've also included the uh, link at the bottom of the slide to that, the Kennedy paper that outlines Landtrender. So, um, while I'll go through an overview of the algorithm here, I, I want you to direct you to that paper for more, more um, detailed questions. So again, going back to the process of what Landtrender does, first, yearly Landsat mosaics are created to eliminate issues with data gaps, clouds, snow, um, smoke, and, sh and shadows. For each image, geometric and radiometric correction is applied. Then each image is normalized using a tasseled cap transformation. 
in order to properly evaluate images that may have been collected from different Landsat sensors and to account for variability in things like brightness or sun angle. Then a composite image is used for each year in the stack. So to explain this pixel-based approach a little bit more, in order to assess the influence of gaps, clouds, etc., each image in the time series was compared to a single reference image. The tasseled cap transformation was applied and a cloud score and a shadow score for each pixel is generated based on the brightness and wetness values from that transformation. These scores are based on a single reference image and thresholds are then determined. If a pixel occurs, if a pixel has a value outside of that set threshold, it will indicate that that pixel has one of these issues and it's removed and another pixel from that year is used. The next pixel is chosen from the image closest to that in median Julian days of the image of the whole stack. This is done iteratively until you have a pixel that meets the outline criteria. So this is done for all pixels across each yearly mosaic. And then that, that stack um, is generated for each year of the date range that you are doing your analysis over. Temporal segmentation is used to capture both abrupt and slow phenomena in the Landsat time series. By temporal segmentation, we refer to modeling a pixel's spectral time series as a sequence of straight line segments that capture the broad features of the trajectory, eliminating noise but not sacrificing sufficient detail. So you can see um, this figure here on the right um, shows how the image data is reduced um, to that for each index and divided into these segments. So the steps of this process essentially are to create a complex fitted model, then iteratively simplify the model, then choose the best model based on statistics of, um, of the model, and then finally to remove any change that is considered noise. And again, I really wanna um, direct you to uh, Kennedy's paper um, that I showed earlier on slide 13 for um, some of these more minute details. So here's an example of the best fit model for multiple pixels in an image from the Cascades in Oregon. Along the top of this figure, you can see three dates, 1984, 1995, and 2004. And here we have six pixels selected from each of those dates. Along the bottom, you can see the NBR, or the normalized burn ratio, values from each pixel plotted across time from 1984 to 2006. The figure displays each value from each pixel for each year. The black line represents the model with the best fit for each of those pixels. Notice that the number of segments differs depending on the nature of change for each, each pixel. This example represents the various types of change you can observe. For example, pixel one is a region that shows slow moving disturbance caused by insect infestation. There appears to be a gradual decline from about 1984 to 1994, and then some kind of recovery where the vegetation is growing back. Pixel two shows a short duration, very high magnitude event like clear cutting, where the NBR value is negative the year after the trees were harvested. Pixel four shows gradual decline for many years, and this is likely caused by insects. And then we see a major high magnitude event like a fire. Five shows a stable forest that has a wildfire event around 2007. And then six shows gradual increase in the NBR throughout the series. Um, and this could maybe indicate potential recovery 
um, from a fire that occurred before the um, 1984 image. So by examining both of the short-term and long-term changes, we can see um, many kinds of change in this type of dynamic ecosystem. And that's really the benefit of using this type of algorithm. Here's another similar example, also from Oregon. At the be beginning of its record around 1984, there was a mature second growth conifer stand. And for about 17 years, little changed. Then between the summers of 2000 and 2001, a service road was built, removing some of the vegetation. Over the next year, experience clear cut harvest, removing all of its remaining vegetation. For the last 14 years, there's been regeneration. Um, most recently, it was a closed canopy maturing conifer stand. And so you can see those dynamics happening here um, in this image along the bottom from each of those years. So the land tra trender algorithm was originally implemented in an interactive data language. But with some of the help from Google engineers, it's been ported onto Google Earth Engine or GEE. The GEE framework nearly eliminates the onerous data management and image pre-processing aspects of that initial IDL implementation. It's also much faster than IDL, where computing time is now in a matter of minutes instead of a matter of days. In GEE, the process is written in JavaScript. So if you have familiarity with that language, you can process it on your own, and you could also make more specific adjustments. However, for this webinar, we will only focus on the user interface or the UI. Within the GEE program, two really important steps in image collection building include, one, masking cloud and cloud shadow pixels um, during that annual image um, compositing, like I mentioned earlier, and then two, to ensure that the spectral band or the index that is, that is to be segmented is oriented so um, vegetation loss is represented by um, a positive delta. So for example, the NBR in its native orientation results in a negative delta when vegetation is lost. Um, and in this case, the NBR must be multiplied by negative one before being sub segmented. Um, within JavaScript, the implementation takes um, nine arguments to adjust the spectral temporal segmentation and the dates for the annual image collection. So all of these parameters can be set specifically in the user interface as well. Um, or if you are writing it in JavaScript, you can modify these parameters through the code editor. And we are just going to be working with the default settings for a lot of these very specific parameters, again, um, in this training. Um, but if you're interested in how to modify those, um, again, reference that paper. After this lecture is over, we'll be walking through the exercise using the Land Trender user interface. Um, but I just wanted to mention a few of these pieces before we get started. We are just going to be exploring the pixel time series plotter and the change mapper in the exercise. Um, and we won't cover the fitted index delta RGB mapper, but I'll talk a little bit about it. So first off, um, you can see here what the pixel time series plotter interface looks like. Some of the parameters are defined on the left, and we'll work through some of these. Then there are plots generated on the right, such as the NBR or other indices like NDVI. So this is really useful for simply exploring and visualizing the spectral temporal space of a pixel. Um, and for comparing the effectiveness of a series of indices for identifying landscape change. And you can also use this to sort of parameterize your um, land trender work 
for your study area. So you can really um, hone in on the indices and the um, values that are useful for you in your region. So this image shown here is a, um, the, a pixel that was randomly chosen near Prospect, Oregon. And um, we can see some changes um, on the, the landscape here just by looking at, at um, a normal um, Google Earth image. In the change mapper, once you select a location, three maps will be produced. Year of change detection, magnitude of change, and duration of change event. You can also view the pre-change spectral value of that pixel. In this image, again here, the year of detection is displayed, meaning that the year where some type of disturbance happened is identified as a different color. And so this is the same area that I showed in the previous slide, and you could see, um, just by glancing at it, even without looking at the legend, there um, appears to be a lot of disturbance happening in many different years with um, multiple colors shown here. The fitted index delta RG me mapper is designed to help you identify areas of change or non-change over time. Each color, red, green, and blue, are assigned a year of spectral data. And then those data are composited into an RGB image, or red, green, blue image, where each of the colors are mixed by a weighting of spectral intensity for that year that's represented. This is, again, the same location um, and same time period that I showed from the last two images. Again, you can see high variability among um, much of these patches throughout the region. And this could be um, some type of clear cutting um, or agricultural development in the region. So this figure helps you identify what these colors are, are representing in terms of red, green, and blue um, from that last slide. Here you can see three location examples. In all three examples, Red is dominant when change is observed in the earlier years, or closer to 1984. Green is dominant in the middle years, closer to 2000. And blue is dominant when change is observed closer to the later years, such as 2016. So each pixel will be some color combination of the three, and will vary based on uh, when the change is occurring on the landscape. This is essentially like a ternary diagram where each value is plotted as a proportion of three variables or, or colors. And in this case, each variable is one point in time. So if you look at this image on the far right of the slide, you can imagine what that would be in terms of percentage or closeness of the disturbance happening in that year or another. And then the color diagram will represent um, where, when the change is, is likely occurring. So with that in mind, based on the color you observe in the map, you can begin to get an idea of the date of change in your region and where you might be interested in investigating. Then you can take a look at the pixel plotter or the change mapper after you get a feel for what's happening on the landscape. Um, the way that I understand this tool is it's best to sort of begin your investigation and start to get an idea of of what's going on, is change occurring over multiple years, around the same year, is it patchwork, is it one large landscape change, and then you can use the other two, um, the pixel plotter as well as the change mapper to investigate further. So now, um, before we go into our exercise, I wanted to speak briefly about a few other vegetation disturbance algorithms. And what I'm going to do here is I'll first mention those best designed for forest only. And then I'll outline a few that can be used for a wider, a wider range of vegetation types. The forest only algorithms will be indicated with a, a little tree icon along the top, while the all vegetation algorithms will be indicated with a grass icon. 
Um, so you'll see those in the subsequent slides here. The Vegetation Tra Change Tracker, or VCT algorithm, is similar to Landtrender. However, it should only be used for forested regions, and it has been shown to work best for short-term discrete events. It has a two-step approach. First, each image in a Landsat stack is analyzed to mask out water, clouds, and to assess the likelihood of each pixel to be forested. Then it uses this integrated forest score, or likely of it, likelihood of it to be a forest, with the NBR to assess change over time. For all of these algorithms, um, again, we've included uh, the link to the paper, um, and this is the peer review publication um, about the algorithm. So please refer to those um, papers for more in-depth questions about the, these specific al algorithms, um, as that, that's where you can find that information um, probably better than I can explain it offhand. So I just wanted to make note of um, those uh, papers shown here. Next, the exponentially weighted moving average ch change detection algorithm was developed to address issues of data gaps. Again, um, like we've mentioned, things like cloud cover, data quality issues um, in a series of, of Landsat images. This algorithm uses a time series approach that focuses on the residuals from a harmonic regression. Um, and they do this in order to identify more subtle changes, such as slow land degradation um, on the landscape. This process, however, also still allows for identification of high magnitude changes, such as wildfires, um, to be observed. In this image here, you can see the wide range of change from growth in green to thinning in yellow to removal of vegetation in orange and red. And this large um, identifiable line you can see across the image is a tornado path um, that occurred near Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So this gives you an example of what the outputs from this type of um, algorithm look like. The vegetation regeneration and disturbance estimates through time uses neural networks to detect clouds for masking and to explore the spectral information. So this is different from the land trender algorithm in that it constructs segments of pixels and assigns a common value prior to detecting change. It can be used for discrete events and gradual change, thus variable uh, length disturbances, and for a broad range of magnitudes. So low, low magnitude disturbance, high magnitude disturbance. However, again, this can only be used in forests. In this example, in the image shown here on the right, the magnitude of change is indicated with the intensity of the color, where darker areas have higher change than lighter areas. Disturbed regions are shown in red, regenerating regions are in blue, and the um, green regions have both. The image trends from regression analysis is a simple approach that's focused on linear regression of a series of Landsat images. And this is done on a pixel by pixel basis. Note that I've included both the forest and the grass icon here because the algorithm is best for all woody vegetation. And so this could include shrubs. Because this algorithm is a linear regression approach, it works best for gradual trends um, and a broad range of disturbance instead of just focusing on really short-term events. This algorithm has also been shown to be effective um, in a broad range of vegetation types. Um, as I mentioned, all woody vegetation. 
And the image shown here is from Nebraska, where the vegetation ranges from grasses to brush and um, agriculture shown here as well. With, with most um, algorithms, an index is used to analyze these changes. Here, the NDVI is shown and is the most common um, to be used with this type of um, algorithm. So the last two algorithms that I will mention here can be used for all vegetation from forest to grasslands and therefore have um, this grass designation icon here along the top. The multi-index integrated change analysis is one algorithm used in the development of maps for the US National Land Cover Database, or NLCD. With the development of land cover maps, comprehensive change detection methods are used, which incorporates this algorithm and another approach called zone. And the, the zone approach focuses on just two Landsat images in time, so it's not necessarily um, a time series approach. The land cover maps are also uh, generated using ground data and specialist knowledge for this national land cover database. Um, but it's a very commonly used and um, extensive um, database. The unique feature of this algorithm is that it uses four spectral indices for analyzing change over time. The difference normalized burn ratio, the difference normalized different vegetation index, the change vector, and a new index called the relative change vector maximum. And again, you can learn more about these algorithms in the um, paper shown here at the bottom of the slide. This algorithm works best for discrete events and for high magnitude events. One potential weakness of this algorithm is that it might miss some subtle changes on the landscape. Finally, the continuous change detection and classification algorithm focuses on multi-year departures of a phenology model, which uses seasonality, trends, and high magnitude events or breaks to analyze change. As with many of the algorithms, it first masks out clouds, and in this case, snow, before it constructs the time series analysis. Land cover classification is also conducted after the time series analysis, just like the um, last process shown um, for the National Land Cover Database. This algorithm is best for identifying discrete events, but it's limited in terms of the range of magnitudes. And again, this, this algorithm is um, most effective for high magnitude events. Okay, so to summarize here, time series analysis is a really powerful tool to identify disturbance patterns across a landscape. This is especially important for establishing relationships between human activities and drivers of natural disturbance. In this session and for the exercise, we will focus on land trender, which is used to identify patterns of change in forest, um, that differ in length and magnitude. When conducted in Google Earth Engine, the processing can be done really quickly um, and the visualization is done on the fly, which we will see soon. Uh, finally, there are many algorithms for mapping disturbance, um, as I've gone through some of these here. So it's really important for you as the user to decide which to use based on your region of interest um, and your things like your vegetation type, the length of the disturbance, the magnitude of possible disturbance. And what you could also do is um, conduct analysis with multiple algorithms and test the accuracy of your map um, to identify which type of algorithm might work best for you. Um, so if you are an advanced user and you're somebody who um, has the ability to do these types of calculations, it might be advantageous for you to um, take a look at multiple algorithms and just see um, which one's going to work best for whatever um, your specific 
um, region of interest is. Okay, so now we will go through the steps of our um, land trender exercise. So just bear with us here as we um, transfer over um, and get this set up and, and moving. All right, everyone. So now on to the land trender exercise. Um, so I would recommend that you just follow along and listen um, to us going through the step by step of the um, of the actual exercise. Um, but what we'll probably do is have a lot of these maps pre-generated. So um, it's going to take you a while to get through the exercise because especially depending on your um, connection speed, um, some of the layers can take a few minutes to um, load. So I just want to make you all aware that um, if you are trying to follow along, you might get behind. Um, and so what I would suggest doing is just kind of listening and, and watching and then um, using the recording that will be available in a few days um, to actually go back and um, do the exercise if you have questions about what we um, did here. Uh, but everything is also outlined step by step in your um, exercise guide as well. So we are going to explore Land Trender in Google Earth Engine. And I've just displayed the uh, main website uh, for the Land Trender page here. Um, and this is a really great resource for you to come back um, for any specific questions. Um, here you can also obtain um, JavaScript to run the algorithm um, yourself without using the user interface. Um, so take a look at um, some of this documentation here. Um, I really um, do suggest going through some of that on your own. <clears throat> and um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be exploring two of the three um, user interface applications in this exercise. So here um, we've essentially brought you to the um, user application website to begin the exercise. So here you can see some information about each of these UI applications. Um, and we're going to start off with the change mapper. And we are going to examine a um, really large wildfire um, that occurred in um, right outside of Yosemite National Park here in California called the Rim Fire that um, happened in 2013. So on page two of your exercise, you'll see an image of that fire, and then we will do some investigating on that. So the first thing that you need to do is um, you can see each of these features for the user interface. And if you just click on the link here, you'll be taken to each of these um, different uh, options. So as I mentioned, we are going to first go to the um, change mapper. And this is what the change mapper looks like when you first arrive um, at the website. And um, just take a look and review the features for the user interface. You can see um, you can define a lot of the parameters here on the panel on the left. Um, but we, what we're going to do is zoom into a pixel, a specific pixel, within the uh, rim fire and take a look at that. So what you're going to do is come over here to the define pixel coordinates and the longitude and latitude here. And on page three, we've specified um, the actual values to enter here. So what we're going to do is in longitude, enter negative one. 19.8529. And for the latitude, we are going to go to 37.8514. And now we're just going to go ahead and leave all the um, other options as default. We'll talk through some of them later, um, but leave them as default for now. And then scroll down to the bottom of the the um, panel here on the on the left and click submit. 
When you do this, you'll um, initially be taken right to that location. Um, so you can see here on the image, you can see Yosemite Valley, Yosemite Valley here um, on the um, closer to the bottom um, of the image, um, and we're we're essentially looking at much of the Sierra of of California. And what you'll start to see is as the uh, processing takes place, you'll start to see the uh, image layers pop up here. What you'll notice along the top are these layers. So we have year of detection, magnitude, and duration. And as the image is processing, you'll see these gray bars um, sort of turn to white. So each layer is, is pretty early in its processing step. Um, for me, it's been taking about two to five minutes uh, for depending on how far you're zoomed out. So what Google Earth Engine is actually doing is it's conducting all, it's, it's processing the algorithm for the area that you see in the user interface. So if you're zoomed in further, it might not take as long to um, generate these layers because it's only doing the processing over a smaller um, region. So as the image populates, um, as I've already done this before, sort of uh, like a baking show where we have our uh, beautiful cake already made, we'll just go ahead and take a look at this image here. And this is essentially just the layers have all been processed for uh, the same region and site where we just were. So here, if you take, if you hover over each of these layers, you'll see a little gear symbol appear. And if we just click on the gear symbol for the year of detection, you can see uh, the uh, legend for the colors that are being displayed here. Um, you can also see the date range. So the range is 1985 to 2017. And you can modify these um, if you'd like as well. So what this is essentially showing you is uh, the color is being represented for um, the year where the disturbance occurred. And we'll take a little bit of a closer look. Um, so now, you know, if you're, if you're following along, if you're looking at the exercise, we're on about page six. So if we want to see um, when the disturbance occurred, if we want to investigate this, we can click on the inspector box, which is here along the right hand side. And now um, what I'm going to direct you to do is click somewhere in here along this big orange area. And this is the um, outline of the rim fire. So if you just direct your hover your mouse over that red area and click on it. After a moment, a um, figure will be displayed along the right hand panel. So you just saw that pop up there. And what this shows you is the um, NBR, the normalized burn ratio, for that pixel across that time frame. You can also then click on this little small box with the arrow and it should open up a new tab in your window and you can see um, the graph more clearly. You can also download these, these images as a PNG, um, and, and you can download the specific data as a CSV file as well, if that's what you're interested in. So what we can see here is we see a little bit of decline occurring in this pixel in the early 90s, but it's pretty stable, um, which means that the forest has been pretty stable throughout time. Um, and then we see this really sharp drop in 2014. So this also helps display the, um, each yearly pixel value is in the blue as the original. And then you can see the fitted line is essentially like those segments 
from the different trajectories that we um, talked about in the lecture. Um, so that's the red line. Um, so what we can see here is from 2013, there was a, a positive NBR value of um, 538. And so um, I've, I've made a, a note here in on page six of the exercise, but each of these values um, should be uh, divided by a thousand. So we're, we're normalizing these. So it, this is essentially 0.538. And in 2014, we see this large decrease. Um, so this is essentially indicating to us that um, at some point in 2013, a fire occurred um, after this date of the pixel was taken. And um, in 2014, there, the vegetation signal, um, it appears that there was some kind of event, disturbance, a burn. And then you can start to see recovery um, as in 2015 and 2016. And then maybe something's happening um, here after 2016, where we're seeing some de vegetation decline again. Um, but it's it's very clear that some large scale, high magnitude event occurred um, in 2013. So the value, um, if you're following along to this, your value will look a little different unless you clicked on the same exact pixel that I did, which is unlikely. So if we just go back to our change mapper here, um, what we were looking at initially, you can keep doing this kind of inspection. You can click around different dates, um, different colors. So if I just click on a, a blue spot somewhere in here, um, we can see that the, um, the graph changed along here on the right. Um, we can see that the year of change where, where the largest amount of change was detected was 1997. And again, we could open this up and take a closer look at all of these if we, if we'd want it, if we wanted to, but it looks like there are multiple um, sort of large scale disturbances happening throughout the record um, on that pixel. So you can investigate this a little further here. Go ahead and close the uh, legend for the year of detection. And what we're gonna do now is just come over here and turn off the year of detection layer so we can see the magnitude layer underneath. Um, so you just uncheck this box and now we can see the magnitude. Now it looks pretty clearly like some kind of fire occurred. Um, if you compare this image to the outline of the burn area, um, shown on page two of the exercise, you can see um, that it, this, is, this is in fact the rim fire that occurred here. So what you're seeing here now is higher intensity burns in the red and the orange colors and lower intensity in the greens and blues. So we can also take a look at the uh, legend for the magnitude. And here the um, magnitude ranges from zero to a thousand. And the magnitude of the disturbance is defined as the distance in spectral values, in this case NBR values, between the beginning of the disturbance and the lowest NBR value reached. So if we come in here and then we close the um, magnitude legend, we will also now come in here and look at the duration layer. So we'll come back and turn off the magnitude layer and we can see the duration of change. Again, let's take a look at the duration legend. So the duration is shown with each um, year being represented as um, one value. So the um, length of change that we're observing is happening on a range of one to 10 years. So the um, short-term events, such as things like wildfires, are indicated in red here um, with this color palette shown in the, in the legend. 
And then the changes that are occurring maybe more gradually over longer period of time, multiple years, are shown in the greens and blues. So what we um, might take from this in just an initial investigation is it looks like there's some kind of large scale um, short term event that happened, i.e. the rim fire. But it also looks like there's some kind of change occurring, um, more gradual change over much of the um, Sierra to the east. And this could be indicative of something like uh, mountain pine beetle infestation. These longer term um, events um, could also be related to multi-year drought, um, some kind of decline in the vegetation that's occurring more gradually over a longer period of time. Okay, so we'll go ahead and close this, this layer now. So there are, as I mentioned, there are many things that you can change in the panel here. We're not going to go through a lot of them in this training, um, so I encourage you to do it um, on your own. But one thing I did want to mention that's very specific to Google Earth Engine is this define date range. And for those of you who have worked in Google Earth Engine before, um, you might know th this exists, but it's it's a little different than if you're doing image processing in software like Envy um, or Airdos Imagine, where you have downloaded um, discrete dates, where you have um, one date from Landsat and all of the pixels displayed from that single date. What Google Earth Engine does to generate these cloud-free images is um, it, it takes the pixel value that is um, maybe not masked by clouds or um, snow or shadows um, within some kind of date range. So what's being displayed might not be the same pixel, uh, the same pixel from the same date across the entire image. So what this tells you is that the pixels being displayed are selected between June 10th and September 20th for each year. So if, for example, the Lance, Landsat passed over this area on um, June 11th, most of the images are likely from June 11th if it's a clear image. Um, but if it's a cloudy image, the pixels might be chosen from the next revisit time, which is 16 days, about 16 days later. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. I mean, you can get more guidance about this um, on some of the Google Earth Engine documentation of how they display the images, but it's really important to, to know that this defined date range is, um, you, if you want to be very specific, if you want all of the pixels to come from one date in time of a Landsat overpass, you're going to need to really refine this date range. Um, however, you might get missing data or data gaps if you do that. So um, there's sort of a trade-off here that, that you need to be aware of and you need to think about when, when using um, this technique. So hopefully that didn't confuse everyone more, but I wanted to make you all aware of the caveats of, of using um, Earth Engine for this type of analysis. Okay, so now if you're following along in the exercise, we're on the bottom of page 10. And um, now that we've visualized some of these dynamics in the change mapper, I wanted to show you what the pixel time series plotter looks like. So, um, if we come back to the initial documentation, again, you can see the pixel time series plotter link shown here. And we can go um, directly to um, that link, maybe open it in a new tab um, so we don't get confused. And the pixel time series plotter looks really similar um, as the change mapper, but it will display some different things when we actually click on a point or identify a specific latitude and longitude. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use that same um, value for the pixel coordinates, and then we're going to select a few indices to examine. 
So again, if you're following along, um, we've indicated to change the start year to 2000 and the end year to 2017. So essentially what you're going to see is a value from each year from 2000 to 2017. Um, and you can make this as, uh, as wide or as um, narrow as you'd like, depending on the date range that you're interested in. Or again, you can leave it as default if, if um, you'd like. Here you can see that we have the option to, um, we're also, just to let you know, we're gonna leave this date range as the default. And they've set this um, as sort of the, um, in the Western Hemisphere, the summer um, date range where um, vegetation is the, the greenest, but you could change this if you'd like um, as well. Here you will notice that there are uh, multiple indices that you can take a look at. Um, so the nice thing about this is if you select a specific pixel of interest, you um, can see these indices side by side. So you might see some differences depending on your study area in between, between these indices. Um, again, you can um, obtain information about these indices and what they mean um, by going back to things like the um, introduction to remote sensing and, and there there's a lot of literature about these indices out there so um, so what we're going to have you do is select the NBR, NDVI, NDMI, the normalized difference moisture index we haven't talked about that much and the TBC which is the tasseled capness tasseled cap brightness um, and then under here where we're going to define the pixel coordinates. Um, if you don't have a specific coordinate in mind, you can just click on the map. Um, as you see when I hover, there's a little hashtag here um, where you can just click, but we want to make sure we're looking at the same exact thing. So we'll type, go ahead and type it in. One, one nine, eight, five, two, nine. And now we're at the top of page 11. And again, 37.8514. So we're going back to that same area in the Sierra Nevada of California. And then just click Submit. And this works a little quicker than the um, change mapper because you're not generating all those layers and running the process for every pixel displayed here um, on the map. You're just Essentially, you're just plotting the um, time series plots of this very specific pixel. So what you can see here now is the um, plot for each of these indices that you selected before you click Submit. So you have the NBR, NDVI, NDMI, and TCB. So let's go ahead and take a look at the NDVI here. And we see similar patterns that we observed with the NBR, right? Where we saw um, the, a decrease from 2013 to 2014. Um, as indicated, again, um, there, there's a scaling that needs to occur here. So we go from essentially um, 0 0.7, which is a pretty high NDVI value. NDVI ranges um, between negative 1 and 1, um, to 0.289 in 2014. So you can see a pretty dramatic decrease in the um, vegetation index, um, thus indicating um, less healthy vegetation in this region. Okay, so that is uh, the uh, time series, uh, pixel time series plotter um, shown with that example of the rim fire. So what we're going to do now is um, take a look at a different type of disturbance event. And um, in this example, we're going to look at mountain pine beetle infestation in Colorado. So the, for those following along, at the bottom of page 12, um, Going on to page 13, uh, we've included a figure there um, from this really great uh, Forest Service paper that outlines um, mountain pine beetle um, 
tree mortality in the Rapaho Roosevelt National Forest. And this is just outside of Denver, um, along the Front Range region of, um, of Colorado. So what we're going to do here is we're going to um, use the pixel time series plotter at, as our starting point, as opposed to the um, change mapper, but we'll get to that one. Um, so you can just stay right here in your uh, pixel time series plotter, or you can start over fresh if you'd like as well. We've included the link again. Um, so here we're going to ensure that our date range is from 1984 to 2017, just starting off with a broad swath, a, a, a really wide date range. We're going to um, keep the date range here set to default for now. We are only going to examine NBR, NDVI, and NDMI. We're going to take this tasseled cap brightness off. And now we're going to um, zoom into a different area. Um, so we have indicated um, new pixel coordinates for you. So here it's negative 1.05, 105.77. Two, six, seven, and 40.0825.6. Now we're going to keep everything else as default, keep it simple, and click submit again. What you can see here now is um, our image has moved. Um, over to the um, Arapaho Roosevelt National Forest, and you can see our pixel here. Just first glance at what this Google Earth image looks like, it definitely looks like the um, trees here are a little sort of brownish, reddish, um, maybe more sparse than um, the, some of the other regions um, up here in the Northwest. So just by first glance, if you're familiar with uh, Mount Pine Beetle infestation, this looks like a potentially a hot spot for, for that occurring. Also, again, you can see um, the time series plots shown, shown over here on the right. And let's just take a look at the NBR more specifically. So what you can see here now um, in comparison to the previous example that we did with the rim fire, is it appears that we have pretty stable forest, um, some you know high, um, some declines, some increases, but then from about 2005 to about 2012, we see a more gradual dec decline in this vegetation. So this is more indicative of the mountain pine beetle signal in the time series record, where it's not this one big extreme event, it's um, sort of slowly progressing as the trees slowly die off. Um, and you can observe that in the other indices as well, in um, back here in the time series plot, if you would like. And again, just hovering over these, moving them along, you can see the values offhand. Um, but then you can, you can obtain the actual um, data um, if you'd like as well. Okay, so um, the next step that we're going to do is we are going to take a look at the um, change mapper for this specific region as well. Um, so we're going to go back to our um, Land Trender application page and then go um, right here to the change mapper. Open that up. And we're going to make a few modifications here that we didn't in the last example. So we're going to keep the define your range as default. So we have that broad range. But we're going to change the um, date range. So again, this is what I mentioned about being very specific about the pixels that you're including um, based on um, the, the date and time. And we're just going to go ahead and change this to only include pixels from July. So we change this to 0701 
and 0801. So for 01. So for every year when a um, composite Landsat image is generated, it's only pulling pixels within July for this example, for this date range that we have. Um, you might want to play around with that. Um, if you have um, too narrow a, a region, you might have a lot of missing pixels. Um, but if you have too broad of a region, you might have um, you might be observing some noise or a change in phonology that you may not um, be interested in observing. Um, so those are the, the ups and downs, pros and cons of, of changing this, this date range here. We are again going to change our latitude and longitude to our um, Colorado example. And again, we're going to keep all of these other parameters as default. Um, if you're interested in these segmentation parameters, I would really refer to the, um, the paper about what, what all of these mean. So things like mass, max segments, so that's the um, thresholding for the um, highest number of um, discrete segments that are going to be generated in the, the fitted model that we talked about earlier, right? Um, there is a piece of the model where they pull out um, a really large spike that may be some kind of um, random event or noise or things like that. Um, and again, you can, you can see what all of these specific parameters mean, but essentially it um, parameterizes the model that's being used here. Um, so we'll go ahead and click Submit. And again, this is um, going to take a little while for these layers to pop up. As you can see, um, the layers panel here um, is working. It's, when it's gray, it's working and processing. And then when, when it's white, it is um, totally done. OK, so now this is the um, fully finished loaded layers of the process that we just um, entered. Um, so we went, and ha went ahead and did 1984 to um, 2017, and then we changed this the start and end date here um, for this region and click Submit. And um, now each of our map layers have loaded. So the first thing that you might notice is um, in comparison to the last example that we did, the uh, year of detection is more varied. Um, we don't see that one large um, bright red area where most of the change occurred in that single year. What we're observing now is um, change occurring over many different years and um, in certain um, places throughout the, the image here. So what we're going to do is just, if, again, if you hover over these layers, and go to year of detection until the gear symbol appears and go ahead and click on the gear symbol. And what we're going to do here is um, change the range here in the um, symbology so that we can really zoom into the um, date range where we're observing a lot of the change occurring um, in this region. And based on the paper and some of the other information that we have, we know that most of the change is occurring from 2000 to 2017. So again, like we just showed the example of the time series plotter, that might be a great place to start and um, identify when you want to um, zoom in on in, in terms of the year of focus. So when we do that, we need to click apply. And we're going to need to wait for that layer to reload. Um, only that one layer will reload. Um, but sometimes I um, close this and I click back on the layers panel or just hover over the layers panel. And you could see it loading here. 
Um, and that's not all three, it's just the, the one, um, the um, year of detection that's, that's um, showing change. As this is loading, I just want to mention that you can also filter by um, specific dates in these defined change mapping parameters. So um, these are these are really interesting because you can look at things like loss or gain of vegetation. Um, you can sort the change based on greatest, newest, oldest. So um, for example, when you do that inspector option over here on the right and click on inspector, you can um, have it, the inspector is default set to the greatest change is that the year of change that's identified, but you can set it to um, the least or the oldest, whatever you're interested in. But you can also filter, use these filtering to um, change the start and end date of, of change that's displayed in the layer of the map. Um, so while you have your define year range at the very top, going across the entire um, time period, what's being then displayed in the map layer can be filtered. So you can actually have all that data being processed, but just filter it to display a little differently over here. Um, so the same thing can be done either in the legend, um, which is what we, we showed, which is what's loading now, or you can filter it here um, in just in terms of the display. So now as this is loading, we can see um, this change occurring in terms of the year of detection. We're seeing a lot of change that's happening at two, year 2000 or before, um, but then also a lot of change that's occurring um, a little later. So these, each color uh, square is representing about two years in this example. And so we can see um, the, the change really happening um, close here to Lake Granby around that 2005, um, six, seven time frame with the blues and the greens represented. So you can modify these features and really zoom in even more. Um, in the exercise, we also have you change the um, year range to 2000 to 2012. So if you really, again, want to zoom in even more um, and have uh, each of these represent a more discrete time period, you can do that. Um, you can also add or subtract um, the color scheme here and change the color scheme to whatever it is that will help you identify your patterns um, more um, clearly and visually. So if we, um, in the year of detection legend, now change the date to 2012, we can click apply again and the process will run again. And um, it'll look a little different just because we've changed the color, the color legend. Again, sometimes I like to just hover over this to make sure it's going. So what we're gonna do now is we, for example, want each year to um, be representing, or each color to be representing two years in time. Um, we could even change the range to have each color represent one year in time to really get the specific date on when the change is occurring. Um, but here for this example, we'll just do it by two years at a time. So we have our range of 2000 to 2012. So if we have co six different color um, options, then each color will represent um, two years. So what we've instructed you to do for those um, on the exercise it, on page 16, towards the bottom here is to just subtract one of those. Um, and now we'll have 2000 to 2002, 2002 to 2004, um, and so on as you move through um, the map. 
um, each color will represent two years. Again, I'm reloading this image a lot just to give you an example of um, what we can do with the color scheme and how things can change. Um, it might take you a little while to have these features load. So what we'll also do here is um, zoom in to Lake Granby, which is located right here where we're starting to see the map layer load. Um, and that will start the process over for everything. Um, so if we zoom in twice to Lake Granby, we will see all of these layers reload. So again, like I mentioned earlier, um, whenever you zoom in or out, Google Earth Engine will run that process over only the area that's being displayed um, in the map. So if you um, really want this to go a lot more quickly, zoom into an area um, that's really small, um, if you have a small area of interest and you're maybe having issues with, um, with the map loading, because I know that some of you might be in an area where there's lower bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. So that might be more difficult. Also here, you might notice as the maps are loading that because we've defined this date range to be a smaller range, um, there are some areas where there are missing pixels in terms of our layers. Um, the, the Google Earth image being displayed will still just be um, the composite image that's generally displayed in Google Earth, but the layers are only selecting from our date range. Um, so in this area, there might have been some clouds with the overpass of Landsat um, in this region, and therefore those pixels were removed in the process. Okay, so now that the uh, layer has loaded, we can see that the um, year of detection of change um, is occurring in certain specific years down here. Um, so now that we have six different colors in our palette um, and 12 years of data, each color is representing two years. And if we want to investigate further in terms of where, what time we're seeing this disturbance occurring, um, we can use, again, the inspector option. And we're seeing a lot of um, disturbance occurring um, here, just south of Lake, Lake Granby, um, with the um, yellows and um, greens. So if we go ahead and click on a um, yellow or green pixel, um, we can see this change occurring here um, in 2006 which um, should be represented by uh, the, within the green range there. Again, if we want to take a closer look, um, we can investigate this NBR uh, chart a little closely by opening that up um, into a new tab. And we can, again, see this sort of steady decline occurring. Um, in the vegetation due to uh, mountain pine beetle infestation. So if we come back to our change mapper um, layers, we can go ahead and close the year of detection. And then let's go ahead and turn off the year of detection um, layer. And what we can see here in comparison to the previous example of the rim fire is that much of this change is um, lower magnitude. So if we want to take a look at the, uh, the legend, we can see um, on this scale of a range of zero to a thousand in terms of the uh, magnitude of disturbance, much of this is green, which is lower disturbance. Um, we do see a high disturbance event here that could be clear cutting or could be a small wildfire as well um, with the orange and um, reds indicating higher magnitude change. Um, so 
again, they, all of these um, signs are pointing towards a mountain pine beetle infestation in comparison to a um, wildfire event. And I just want to mention that there are many different options you can explore on your own in terms of um, the parameters you can change. Um, and if you are a um, JavaScript uh, person, you can use the code editor and modify these parameters really easily and quickly, and um, potentially even more parameters that, you, um, that are displayed here in this user interface. Um, so to, to wrap this up, the time series analysis is a really important technique for analyzing changes in the landscape over time. Um, and the land trender in Google Earth Engine provides a um, really nice uh, approachable way to start doing this type of time series analysis um, without having to download a lot of imagery um, and do the processing on your own computer. Um, and it's really a, a much more approachable uh, way to start off. Um, and you know, there might not be as many um, specific changes you can make to this user interface, but if you're a more advanced user, you can go ahead and, and do that um, using different algorithms or different um, um, options. So what we're going to do is um, I'll just um, close this down and we'll get back to um, just a few things I wanted to mention before we end our session and get into the um, question and answer portion. Again, you can um, hopefully you are adding your questions to the um, Q&A box right now and we'll try to get to as many as we can. If we don't get to your question, um, you can email myself or my colleague Cindy Schmidt at our email addresses shown here. For general inquiries about our site, you can email our program manager, Anna Prados. Her email is shown here. And we also have the, the RSET website. So I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we'll stay on for a few more minutes for um, questions. I also wanted to remind you all that the homework is due in two weeks. Um, please complete the homework and submit the Google form by May 1st. And you might want to go through and take a look at that before you complete these exercises. Um, for any of you who have tried to start doing this exercise, the la uh, layer loading will take a while for uh, some of the parts. So you might want to um, have that available have the uh, option to see what the questions are for the homework and then maybe jot down your answer as you, as you go along as opposed to having to have the um, Google form open during the entire time you do both exercises. Um, so just a heads up with that. Um, so again, thank you all and we will now um, take some questions. All right, everyone. Um, please bear with us while we pull up our um, Google document with the um, questions. Um, and uh, thank you all um, for submitting them along the way here. We were able to um, sort of preview a lot of them and answer them already. And I'll go over um, what those questions are. Um, I did want to mention as well that I know Yes, uh, on Monday, we were having a few issues with the links to the data for exercise one, um, and all of that should be fixed now. So if you are having um, trouble um, accessing those data or um, downloading the uh, exercise, um, please go back to the site and, and try again. Um, and I mentioned it, but uh, please complete the homework if you um, wish to receive a certificate of completion. And um, oftentimes we get emails asking for the certificates, and they do take a while. So um, just please be patient. If you don't receive it within two to three months, um, then let us know. Um, but we do have a lot of um, folks attending these webinars, so to get them out to everyone, it does take a little bit of time. Um, but I want to thank you all for being with us again today. Um, and so now we will uh, try to address some of these questions that um, you've asked and get to as many as we can um, here, here now. Okay.
Um, so the first question that was asked is a really great question and, and a pretty commonly asked question. And the question is, how is it possible to combine different time series of different satellites, such as Sentinel-2 and then the um, various Landsat sensors, to have a complete series? So this, this is definitely being done. Um, however, if you do this process, you need, there are some really important things to think about. So um, Landsat sensors, for example, if you're combining multiple Landsat sensors together, they have different um, properties, they have different radiometric resolutions, different um, bands. And so um, I recommend using the surface reflectance products that are now available for all of the um, Landsat um, sensors. And so these, have all been um, you know, atmospherically corrected, radiometrically calibrated, and they are um, more easily used um, to create these types of time series. And it, it's pretty common to do that. Um, also, um, there are some new products available on Earth Explorer called these Landsat Analysis Ready Data products. And um, they have uh, applied some algorithms to compare across different sensors. There are also um, new indices available, um, such as open water bodies, um, through these Landsat application um, analysis ready data products. So um, we've we've included uh, a link to uh, that resource there. For comparing Landsat and Sentinel, there are uh, more things to consider. Uh, so Landsat and Sentinel have different spatial resolutions. Um, the Sentinel-2 uh, has a higher spatial resolution of 10 meters, but this is something that uh, folks are really working on um, in the research community right now. Um, it, 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 it's a, it's a, it uh, is really beneficial to have uh, these multiple overpasses. We can get a higher temporal resolution if we're using um, Sentinel versus Landsat. And so um, more to come on this but I've also included a link on the document here um, for more information on the Landsat Sentinel Harmonize products. Um, so I believe uh, these products will be um, more readily available pretty soon. Um, and I also wanted to mention that we will uh, post this uh, Q&A document onto the website within a couple of days. So um, you can come back and access all these links that we provided and, and um, look at these answers again. Okay. So question two, um, is the time of year the same for each of the years? You know, uh, for example, 1984, 95, 2014. So in reference to the LandTrender Google Earth Engine user interface, um, it sets a default to use the same time period each year. Um, and that time period is June 10th to September 20th. Um, you can modify that date range. Um, however, it, it's suggested uh, to use the same date range for each year of analysis. So that way you can um, generally expect the vegetation conditions to be similar, right? Um, we, we modified in the exercise, we modified the last example to just show data from July. So you could change this to whatever time frame you are interested in. Okay, um, the next question is LandTrender open source. Um, and could it be applied to interannual time series? So um, the answer to the first question is yes. It's open source. Um, you can run the Google Earth Engine UI um, using the, essentially it, it's built off of the Google Earth Engine platform, right? So Google Earth Engine is accessing all of these um, satellite uh, data and pulling them in and then this, uh, LandTrender user interface essentially sits on top of that. So um, there, there are a lot of questions um, about modifications to um, the LandTrender algorithm and 
I've included, and I'll talk about it um, with some of the other questions, but you can you could code all of this yourself in JavaScript or Python within the Google Earth Engine code editor um, if you don't like the settings of the user interface. We won't go over any of those, but the scripts, there are some example scripts available online, and so we've provided some of the links here, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, currently, the way that the user interface is set up is for annual comparisons, um, as you've, you've noticed through the demonstration of the exercise. Um, however, uh, if you are running the algorithm um, via your own coding, I believe you could change those, some of those parameters. So take a look at those specifics, um, but for the user interface, that's, um, it's just annual comparisons currently. <clears throat> so for question four here, there are a lot of questions about this. Um, the question is, can we use Land Trender for a group of pixels, for example, shapefile or polygon? The short answer is no, um, not with the user interface, um, and, but there's a longer answer. Uh, within the way that Google Earth Engine is structured currently, it's it's a really kind of arduous process to pull in your own polygons, whether they be, um, pull in your own shape files, whether they be polygons or points. Um, right now you have to convert um, a shape file to a KML file, you have to upload it to your Google Drive, and you have to create a um, specific link to that shape file, that zipped folder of the KML file, um, to pull it into, to be displayed in Google Earth Engine. So um, I believe that this is changing soon. Um, from some folks I've talked to who are working directly with Google, um, I think they're gonna be making this process a little more streamlined, so um, stay tuned for that. But right now, um, there are some uh, tools and examples available on how to do this. Um, I also wanna make a plug for Climate Engine, which is, a really great tool where you can do some of these similar time series analysis, um, such as NDVI, et cetera. And they have um, an example there on how you do the process of uploading a, a shapefile to um, sort of that interface. It also sits on top of the Google Earth Engine platform. So um, a convoluted answer, I know, but um, currently within the user interface, you cannot analyze um, larger regions, it's just a pixel by pixel basis for um, creating the time series and, and um, doing the sort of the inspector of, of those um, time series, so. Okay, question five. Um, there were a couple questions on marine habitats. So the question is what kind of algorithms can we use to detect change in marine habitats. And so this is really <clears throat> dependent on the types of change you're investigating. I'm not a marine coastal ecosystem scientist, um, so I hesitate to provide uh, some <clears throat> suggestions. But if you think about it uh, in terms of the ecosystem, if you're monitoring something like kelp forests, that you can identify changes in NDVI over time. Um, it, it seems to me that these algorithms would be very applicable for monitoring those types of things. However, I, I do understand that the marine ecosystem is very dynamic and um, constantly changing. Um, it doesn't really tend to stay in one place like our forests um, over multiple years, so um, there's, there's probably a lot of other complications and things to consider when doing you know, change mapping or running these algorithms over the marine system. And so I've included a couple um, papers that I found just by doing some, some searching online about um, monitoring um, wetlands, coral reefs, and seagrasses um, using remote sensing and change over time. So uh, please do take a look at, at those. Okay, question six. 
The algorithms presented besides Landtrender, is it possible to implement them within Google Earth Engine? Are the scripts available? So I'm not sure. I'm, I, I don't know the specifics about implementing some of these other algorithms. So I would, again, just reference, uh, fall back those uh, papers that we referenced in the lecture. Um, we, for this training, wanted to um, sort of have a more approachable uh, first step at looking at one of these algorithms. So that's why we chose the user interface for Landtrender. Um, but I, again, I would suggest reading through those papers and contacting the developers. It's very likely that you could run these algorithms using um, your own um, sort of coding or analysis, and whether it be in JavaScript and Engine or R, um, the R statistical program has a lot of um, packages to run uh, change detection algorithms, um, such as Random Forest, which we did another training on um, recently. So I would um, do a little digging if you're interested in uh, running um, some of these other algorithms on your own. I just wanted to uh, sort of make you aware of what's out there uh, and uh, give you some, some references for um, sort of taking that deeper dive. So, um, okay, the next question, question seven. Are there plans to add data from 2018 and 19? And um, the short answer is yes. Um, if you are playing around with the uh, Landtrender UI, you'll see that you can, um, at least with the time series and maybe with Change Mapper, it probably with Change Mapper it's only to 2018. Um, but I believe that because the Landtrender UI is just built off of Google Earth Engine, as soon as the data are being pulled into the engine collection, they can be used and processed within this user interface. Um, so um, just take a look at that. Uh, and uh, for uh, seeing what, what data are available now, and I think that it's a pretty quick, uh, pretty quick in terms of the time that the um, images are taken until they are included in the Google Earth Engine collection. There are a couple of questions about Global Forest Watch. And we've talked about Global Forest Watch a lot in some of our other trainings. And it's a really fantastic um, tool for mapping uh, forest change. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Global Forest Watch, I would um, suggest Googling that and taking a look at their um, uh, online tool. But the algorithm used by um, um, Hansen's group at University of Maryland for uh, creating the Global Forest Watch change um, maps are, is different than Landtrender. And we've included the um, paper here for uh, more information about that specific algorithm, but it is different than, than Landtrender that we mentioned here. Okay, question nine. Oh, this is another really great question. Um, the, the question is, which algorithm is the most adequate for studying agricultural or phenological, phenological change throughout an entire growing season where, uh, you know, yearly composites might not be useful, right, if we're um, seeing change occur within the year. So I believe that for a lot of these scripts, again, uh, for a lot of these algorithms, you can run them um, interannually. Currently, as I mentioned previously, you, you can only analyze yearly changes in the user interface of Landtrender. Um, so uh, again, here, I kind of revert back to do your own digging on, on some of these um, algorithms and um, see if you can Im implement them through um, other means. Um, and I mentioned this previously too, but Another, for, another algorithm you could investigate is random forests. And I've included a link to our um, training that we did on change detection. 
um, a little a little while back. So in the change detection webinar, we actually uh, had an R script for uh, running random forest that was developed by um, the um, some folks at the um, uh, Natural History Museum, I believe. And um, so take a look at those. And I, you can maybe modify those and play with those for, for this um, interannual analysis. Um, also, again, uh, making a plug for Climate Engine. But um, within Climate Engine, you can also um, zoom into an agricultural region of interest create your own polygon, um, for example, on you know, a set, center pivot irrigation plot, and look at something like NDVI over time uh, from the Landsat record. And so within um, that tool, you can create these uh, figures directly online um, using the uh, power of GE as well. And you can see um, interannual phenological changes. So you could see things like the multiple cuttings of alpha alpha uh, throughout the year. Um, and that's just based off of looking at NDVI values, for example. So um, that might be another nice resource for you. OK. The next question. Can the, can the change mapper maps be exported as GeoTIFF? Um, the answer is, again, <laughs> yes and no. No from the user interface, not that I'm aware of yet. Um, but yes, if you do your own scripting. So um, within uh, JavaScript, you can write a, a, a short little script for exporting your uh, maps. And I believe you can do that as GeoTIFFs. Uh, again, um, take a look at the example scripts available. They um, are pretty great. Uh, I ran a couple of them in preparation for this webinar, and you don't really need to do a lot of modification to it. So if you're not um, a coding um, person and you just want to kind of go in and look at those parameters and run them, all you need to do is, is get set up with the Google Earth Engine um, code editor, uh, uh, Log in, and you can essentially just uh, open up this script that's in entirely written within your own interface. So take a look at that. OK, question 11. Um, similar to some of the other questions that we've had, how can I use NBR, so the normalized burn ratio, for seasonal burning of crop residues? So again, um, what we've shown here only shows annual change. You could, again, this is something I hadn't mentioned before, but you can you could also analyze seasonal change on your own. Um, by downloading the imagery and running the analysis on something like QGIS or ArcGIS um, in, instead of just using the um, Earth Engine Cloud to run these processes for you. So it's a little more um, involved in terms of timing. Um, but you can download the Landsat data on your own for specific dates of interest um, and um, run something in your own geospatial software as well. So. Um, either with these, some of these other algorithms that were presented here um, using random forests um, or um, some other tools out there. So, um, yeah, okay. Okay, um, the next question. Is there a technique to analyze the change in urban areas? Um, yeah, uh, we get a lot of question about urban change. Um, we are actually going to be doing a um, another advanced webinar in July, I believe, where we will be um, showing trends.earth, which um, you, you can um, use to analyze change in urban areas. Um, as well as in forests. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that one. 
we'll be hopefully um, putting out the registration and, and things for that within the next month or two. Um, so take a look at that. But yes, I mean, you can apply these types of change detection algorithms for um, urban mapping. Some may be better than others. Um, and we've included a paper there about um, monitoring urban change. But that's a good question. Urban systems are uh, tend to be a little more difficult um, because if you think about urban areas, they there there's a lot of uh, mixed pixels. So there are um, you know, tree-lined streets that might have a uh, spectral signature of a building as well as a plant, and so um, it's a little more complicated for urban systems, but it can be done. Okay, the next question. For the pixel time series plotter, for any index of interest, for example, NDVI, would the graphs generated show years where there's missing data or breaks in, in the data? Um, and is it necessary to download the data as a CSV to um, inspect whether there is one point for all the um, years of interest? So. Um, <clears throat> The Google Earth Engine um, algorithm interpolates values for years that have missing data. Um, so the ability to interpolate values um, is really useful. So it essentially aligns each observation to a trajectory that's consistent um, to where the pixel has been and where it's been going. Um, so you can think of this as sort of this hindsight enhanced image time series data. So um, I think some of this uh, might have been taken from the Land Trender um, website that we have here. Um, but this really, essentially what this does is it allows you to um, maintain consistency throughout your um, analysis. So for each Landsat um, stack, uh, each year of data, you have you have a point there. Um, I also wanted to take this time to talk a little bit about the way that Google Earth Engine creates these Landsat composite images. Um, so I mentioned this when we talked about the exercise, but you have the ability to identify the start and end date within each year that you want to obtain the Landsat image. Um, the way that Earth Engine displays the image to alleviate missing data is um, within that range, it will take pixels from potentially multiple different Landsat scenes within that date range. So you might have five or six Landsat images within a certain time period. Um, but you, you don't necessarily know within Earth Engine what specific date is being displayed for each pixel unless you make the date range small enough to be only one Landsat overpass. Um, that's really different from the way that um, folks have been doing this type of analysis in the past where you download a very specific Landsat date and analyze that. Um, so it's just one caveat that I like to make people aware of. Um, so if you want to really ensure that you're getting a pixel from a specific date within, um, what, within what's being shown in Earth Engine, you have to be very narrow with your time window. Otherwise, you might have um, pixels next to each other that are just from slightly different dates. Um, just one thing to, to be aware of there. Um, that was a bit of a tangent, <laughs> but I, it, when I first realized that, I was kind of like, wow, I couldn't believe it. Um, something to be aware of with the way our Earth Engine works. Okay. The next question 
is it possible to modify the scripts? Um, for example, to calculate NDVI, originally used by Earth Engine, so the user can set additional parameters. Um, yeah, so again, you can code all this up yourself. If you um, know what you want to do and you can't do that within the user interface, um, yes. Um, you can run it and you could create an NDVI calculation itself within the Earth Engine coding editor. Um, so you have the flexibility to do all of that. You just have to be familiar enough with the, the coding. And Google has some really great resources. So I encourage you all to, to take a look at what they have. Um, but they have a lot of example scripts on how to do um, some of these things on your own. Okay, um, next question. How does Earth Engine deal with the um, SLC failure in Landsat 7 data, um, which started in 2003? So for those of you familiar with the Landsat 7 data, they have um, the striping where there are these large gaps in data. And um, within Landtrender, um, it the algorithm will not fill the gaps. Uh, within Earth Engine, they, as I mentioned, as I just went off in my tangent, <laughs> about the way they create these um, composite images. Um, but if you are, for example, uh, looking at a time period where the um, you only have Landsat 7 data, um, you're not pulling from Landsat 5 data, or you don't have Landsat 8 yet, you'll just see the, the missing data gaps in there. Um, but Earth Engine really does try to do its best to create these um, no missing data composites. Um, again, we have for reference uh, a link to the algorithms that they use to create those composite images. So take a look at that. Oh, um, my colleague just wrote in there, happy 20th birthday to Landsat 7. I was not aware, so happy birthday. Um, okay, uh, next question. If I understand correctly, the pixel time series plotter allows a user to understand the original and fitted curves of an index of interest. If I want to combine the time series data for a certain number of randomly selected pixel, is that available um, in a streamlined manner within Google Earth Engine as opposed to generating these pixels individually and downloading each CSV separately? So this is really similar to some of the other questions we've had. Um, the short answer is no, um, not within the user interface. You have to look at each pixel individually. Um, and take a look at um, the answer to question four for more um, specifics about that. Um, I really do think that the, this change is going to be happening um, pretty soon, but uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't have the inside intel with Google, so um, that's something that they're, they're, they um, will be working on. <laughs> um, but again, if um, you are interested in this type of area analysis, there are other tools for doing that. You know, I know we talked about appears last um, session, and um, there are other uh, um, packages and tools uh, for doing this within other software as well. So, um, okay, question 17 is also a bit of a repeat. Um, can you tell the link between land trender um, and global forest change? So the land trender algorithm and the global forest watch algorithm developed by Hansen at all and um, at University of Maryland is different. Um, if you want to see how different they are, I would suggest taking a look at the um, papers 
shown here. We have the link to the Hansen paper in a previous, uh, or we have the, um, the citation for the Hansen paper, which is the Global Forest Watch paper in a previous question. And then I've included the link here to um, Robert Kennedy's initial paper in 2010 that outlines all the specifics of Landtrender and how that algorithm works. Okay, question 18 uh, is also a repeat. I know, we all want the area analysis. <laughs> um, you know, who's doing a study over a single pixel? I get it. Um, not currently available. So the question was get a summary of NDVI change over an area. Um, there are other tools available for that type of stuff. Um, I, I'd take a look at climate engine. It's really the, um, the first thing that comes to mind in terms of identifying your own area um, using the Landsat imagery or uh, the, for the MODIS imagery using appears. So both of those tools are, are really great. And then appears should be ha getting the Landsat ima uh, imagery soon as well. Um, so take a look at that. <clears throat> uh, question 19, how can I download the processed images if I want to play with them? Um, Within Google Earth Engine, you can download them yourself um, if you script it. Uh, but I would also recommend uh, going to one of the data, port data portals. So um, Earth Explorer is a great place to um, obtain the Landsat imagery and many other uh, remotely sensed images yourself. So take take a look at Earth Explorer. You can you can Google that NASA Earth Explorer. That's a really great place. Um, where you can download the images uh, there. There's also, there are a few others, such as Landsat Look Viewer, um, but I, I'd start with Earth Explorer. And yes, you can download them. You can uh, open them using QGIS or ARC or um, Imagine or Envy, whatever software that you are most familiar with and, and run the analysis yourself. And again, that's, if you're interested in a very specific date, that might be the best route. Okay, question 20. I was wondering if there's a similar application to get soil moisture, point data like SMAP. Oh, wow, that's a good question. Um, not that we are aware of. Um, there are some uh, visualization tools for soil moisture that we've included here um, as well. Um, so maybe take a look at those and um, see what they have available for uh, assessing change in soil moisture, moisture over time. Um, you know that the um, time frame available for this map data is, is much shorter than say a whole Landsat archive. Um, but I would imagine you could at least investigate changes in soil moisture property over different time periods. Um, you could create sort of a change map yourself using this, this map data, but I'm not um, very familiar with um, accessing and downloading those data. So um, maybe start with those links and um, you could follow up via email if you have other questions. Okay, next question. Um, can we use land trender for marine habitats? Um, so there was a marine question earlier. Uh, we provided a couple links to some papers about monitoring change detection um, for marine habitats. But again, um, the marine system in a lot of ways uh, has complications that the, the, the land doesn't. Uh, so penetration uh, of the um, um, data through the water column is an issue, right? So um, for corals especially, um, some, sometimes the seagrasses tend to kind of float on top of the surface. You can um, pick up things like NDVI a little easier, but corals are really difficult. Um, to, to get information about due to the fact that they're underwater. 
um, at least with these passive type um, optical sensors. Um, the next question, how do we um, integrate our own algorithms? Um, through Google Earth Engine, um, and we've provided a, a link to LandTrender, the online LandTrender guide too, but um, also I would suggest uh, just Googling base, uh, Google Earth Engine example scripts or something like that. Uh, they have a lot of resources. Um, so you can, uh, they have a whole like getting started packet um, where you can go through a lot of those um, codes in JavaScript or Python. So, uh, yeah. Take a look at the LandTrender link, but also um, I'll, I'll uh, Google that as well and um, get the link and we'll post it here on this document too. Um, but yes, there are a lot of uh, resources available for Earth Engine. The next question, um, what about the deal with spatial resolution through different images, right? Um, so we, that was sort of similar to the very first question that we had. Um, if you're using Landsat data, it will all have the same spatial resolution of 30 by 30 meters. If you want to include other um, data types, such as data from Sentinel, um, you're going to need to do something to resolve those um, spatial uh, differences, right? So um, you might have to do some kind of resampling on the Sentinel data to um, conform to the 30 meter uh, Landsat pixel, something like that. So take a look at those resources that we provided um, there as well. Um, and so I know that we do have uh, a few more questions here. Um, and what we'll do is we've, we've reached the time limit here now. Um, and uh, what we'll do is we'll take a look at those questions that we didn't get to during this Q&A session, and we will respond to them by um, just writing them, writing the answers in on the document. And then we'll post the document on the website, the RSET website, in a couple of days. So if you had a question later on um, and we didn't get to it, we apologize, um, but it's great, you know, um, we really love this interaction and the ability to um, answer your questions and, and try to get through them. Um, so if you didn't get your question answered, maybe check back on the RSET website in a couple of days to see if um, we answered it via the document. And if we still didn't answer it, you can email myself or uh, my colleague, Cindy Schmidt, um, with any uh, follow-up questions. So I just, again, wanted to thank you all for being here today. Um, and, and spending the time with us, be sure to complete the homework um, that we need to have those in, by, in two weeks. So I believe that is May 1st um, for the deadline on the homework. Um, and uh, please let us know if you have any other questions. So thank you all and, and have a nice day.